So um, today I'm going to present on um, the work we've been doing in pancreatic cancer. And uh, after I move through that, I'll touch on an example where we're using uh, the MySeq and TrueSeq custom amplicon, the cancer panel, uh, to start profiling uh, pancreatic cancers. And then I'll give one brief example of how this is uh, really starting to help us um, in our sample collection and in, in the clinic. So um, as mentioned, I'm from the Queensland Centre for Medical Genomics. We're a, a fairly small group. Um, we're a team of 36 uh, informaticians, genome biologists, and uh, molecular biologists. We've uh, been going since about 2009 when uh, the founder, uh, we received a uh, NHMRC program grant to become part of the ICGC program um, to study pancreatic and ovarian cancer. So this was the, uh, the largest grant given, uh, largest single grant ever given in Australia. Um, so we've used that over the last two and a half, three years to really build our sensor and, and to go from something that was going to be able to handle the, the 500 genome project of ICGC, but also leave us with enough uh, capacity towards the end of the project to start taking on more exciting and, and new and different uh, applications. So just recently, we've, uh, we've uh, had a lot of changes in the lab. Um, we began the lab with uh, a couple of um, couple of solid instruments, and just recently we've switched over to HiSeqs, and indeed a MySeq has come on board recently. And so this has really opened up um, a lot of new avenues for us. Uh, specifically, it's allowed us to open up a core facility within our building and to start looking at um, areas other than cancer research. So this is all um, managed at the moment through our... Oh. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so everything that we do in the sequencing lab, including our template prep and sample collection, is all managed through our LIMS system, which is um, a combination of the, the released uh, Genealogix Illumina package and a custom configuration for the other technologies. But this really allows us to track everything that we're doing, including the, the capacity and the machine utilization. So I just wanted to, to sort of show where we've come from. So about a year ago, our lab was running uh, 15 solid instruments and a couple of iron torrents. And uh, at the start of this year, we started changing over to high seeks. We now have uh, three high seeks uh, in the lab, a my seek, and we still have one iron torrent. The, the high seeks have recently started being updated to 2,500, so these, these numbers are a little bit out of date. But what you can see is that even on the standard, that's really given us a, a twofold increase in, in what we can deliver in terms of generating sequence quality. So this is how we're able to start moving beyond cancer and into um, other areas of research for the lab. So as I mentioned, we are the Australian um, arm of the ICGC project, and that is to sequence 500 tumor normal pairs over five years. Uh, we work primarily on pancreatic cancer. We're doing about 375 pancreatic cancer uh, samples and about 150 ovarian cancer samples. So I, I'm mostly going to focus on pancreatic today because that's where we've uh, spent the most of our um, time setting up the facility. We have had a recent collaboration uh, with other groups, which is why we're only doing 375 pancreatic cancers, not the 500. So I'll, I'll touch on that shortly. But I think what's important to realize is why we actually study pancreatic cancer. Um, it's often um, not recognized as being uh, the disease and, and the strikingly uh, devastating disease that it is. It's actually the fourth leading cause of cancer-related death. Um, and you can see up there that the median survival is uh, only six months and less than 5% survive after five years. Um, at the moment, there really are limited treatment options with only 20% of the uh, patients presenting being res having resectable disease and only a single um, chemotherapy agent which can be administered as first-line therapy. So if we, if we look a little bit further into pancreatic cancer, and I'm sorry that's a little bit blurry, but what we can see is over the last 30 years, just about all cancers have had a, oops, sorry, had a, uh, a marked increase in survivability. Uh, unfortunately, pancreatic cancer, which sits as the dark blue line right at the bottom, hasn't changed much at all in the last 30 years. Um, coupled with this, we can also see that the amount of research going into pancreatic cancer listed here with the PubMed publications is really quite small. So the big thing for us is uh, collecting samples. Pancreatic cancer is quite a um, heterogeneous disease. Uh, as I said, only 20% are resectable and only a small percentage of those will respond to the first-line therapy gemcitabine. 
The uh, collection of patients for us is handled through the Australian Pancreatic Genome Initiative, uh, which is headed out of Sydney by um, Professor Andrew Biankin. Um, and this is really an important part for us. The recruitment of patients allows us to consent uh, or to have consent given to return data based on the sequencing that we're providing back to the oncologist. The guys down there have also put in a lot of effort in uh, not only the sample collection and pathological data, but also in generating xenograph models for us. And that leads into cell lines as well. Now, this is really quite important because pancreatic cancer is um, notoriously uh, diffuse and the amount of actual tumour material you will get out of a, a pancreatic cancer can be quite low. So that really does affect our ability to sequence and to generate um, and to call the mutations that are present. So on top of our collection uh, workflow, we have our standard uh, genome sequencing workflow. And I really just put this up to, to point out um, what's happening with uh, the sequencing lab. So we really are looking to do whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, methylome sequencing, RNA sequencing, all on the Illumina platform. We also uh, run all our samples across a uh, chip um, microarrays on our SNP chips as listed there. And this is really important for us because this is how we've been able to determine the cellularity of our tumors. So when we began this work, uh, there really was only one uh, paper that really summarised the genomic landscape of pancreatic cancer, and that was this paper from uh, September 2008, which went into sequence 24 uh, exomes by capillary sequencing, and this was done uh, on xenograft and cell lines. And what you can see is that there was a strong uh, set of genes that were found in, in all the tumours, uh, such as KRAS, a high percentage in TP53 and SMAD4. But then what we see is this really long tail of over 914 genes uh, that we mutated in one or more uh, of the tumours. And so this, this heterogeneity of pancreatic cancer really limits the ability for us to detect pathways without doing large sample numbers. It also means that we need to start looking at other options for treatment because obviously with this many mutations um, unique to a patient, we're going to have different treatment options needed. So the first thing we set about doing was when we collected our first 102 patients was trying to make sure that we could detect KRAS um, mutations correctly. So to that end, we set up a, a standard PCR assay uh, where we just sequenced quite deeply the two exons, exon two and three. And we could find that uh, in our cohort of 102, the mutation rate was over 90%. So this tracked quite well. The other reason we did this was that we found that exon 2 of KRAS is uh, notoriously uh, difficult to capture in exome sequencing experiments. And we often find a, a large false positive rate there, or sorry, a, a false negative. So recently, we've um, undergone a, a large exome sequencing project called the ABO collaboration, which was between ourselves in Australia, uh, Baylor and Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. This has uh, recently been published in Nature and was a, a sequencing of 100 pancreatic cancers. So as part of that, we developed a, a tool based on the microarray, uh, microarray work where we were able to predict the cellularity of our tumours using uh, regions of uh, LOH and deletions to plot out what percentage of the sample actually is uh, tumour. And that was also recently published in, in PLOS One. So when we look across our, our cohort of, of 99 samples that went into the, the ABO uh, cohort, what we can see is that uh, there's a strong mix of cellularities all the way from 95 down to less than 10% tumour content in the, in the samples. And we did a lot of mixture modelling on this. Um, using known cell lines to try and model where our sensitivity and accuracy were going to be. Um, from what you can see here is that when we get down to samples that have less than 20% cellularity or tumour content, our ability to detect uh, mutations, our sensitivity drops off quite significantly, so it's less than 50%. So this is why we uh, feel the need that we really need to look to other technologies where we can go extremely deep in these samples to really characterise what's happening in these pancreatic cancers. Unfortunately, when we, when we look across the, the cellularity of our tumours and the number of uh, mutations that were detected, this doesn't track at all with uh, cellularity. So the ability to, to call mutations is completely independent of um, 
or the number of mutations is independent of the cellularity of the tumour. So we really do need to be able to go uh, deep and specific on our tumours to detect mutations in the genes that are of interest to us. So when we started looking at our, our cohort, we found a, quite a strong overlap of, uh, of genes with the Jones paper from 2008. Uh, we also found a lot that were unique to us in our cohort of 100. And from this, we actually came up with a new uh, pathway that's um, strongly uh, perturbed in pancreatic cancer, which is the axon guidance pathway. And this is where we want to start grabbing um, a custom TrueSeq style amplicon to <coughs> capture genes in this region and, and really have a look at what's happening in the, the samples that are less than 20% that we can't sequence um, deep enough on standard technologies. So this is where we'd, we want to split the, the MySeq and targeted panels in. So to do that, we've done a, a brief study looking at the, the standard cancer panel and how that compares. So the reason we looked at the TrueSeq Amplicon cancer panel, um, we were very excited by the, the variant calling pipeline, the speed of which the, the MySeq runs. We found the machines to be extremely reliable, as I'm sure anyone who's used it here would find. Um, the workflow is... Uh, much easier than any other rapid technology that we've worked with. And I think that's important because we're a small group and we really do need to be able to make the most out of um, the equipment we have and not have it be down or people tied up for days on end preparing templates when we can simply put a library in and, and hit go. So this is uh, extremely encouraging for us. The reason we want to look at the cancer panel, of course, is that we see a lot of opportunity there. So I'm going to touch on these further down, but the ability to to assist in the diagnosis of some of the more difficult cases that present to us is uh, of a huge importance. It really will allow us to remove the, the current PCR assay, which is quite laborious and limited. And the detection of actionable mutations is something that we really want to get a handle on because when our patients are consented for the study, there is an option for them to have data returned to their oncologist. And this is really something that we can see um, assisting in, in second line therapies. So the first thing we did was uh, have a look at the designs that were available for a, a standard cancer panel and look at the overlap between them. So about two thirds of the, the sequence content is shared between the two panels that we looked at. Um, most of the genes are in both, except I would point out that uh, two genes are only covered by TrueSeq, so that was rather important to us as well. So to begin looking at this, we took uh, a sample that we had obtained from the Sanger, which was the Colo 829 genome, um, which had been published previously. We used this sample quite a lot for um, benchmarking assays. And so what we've done here is looked at the coverage performance of both the TrueSeq and an AmpliSeq run, um, and then also the overlap between them. So we're only considering the regions that are in common. The first thing you'll notice is that the TrueSeq panel is a lot more uniform in its coverage and a lot higher uh, of on-target bases or covered bases. The thing that I would also point out is that with the AmpliSeq, we needed to do uh, numerous runs to get to the same number of reads generated. So the MySeq generating as many reads as it is um, really lets us do more samples at once and keep the coverage quite high. So even at similar read numbers uh, of about a million reads in the overlap, you can still see that the TrueSeq um, covers uh, almost 90% of the bases at six to 800 fold coverage, which is uh, very important to us, as I said, with the, the low cellularity tumors that we tend to work with. The other thing that I found um, extremely useful about the TrueSeq and the MySeq panels is the, the standard outputs, and that's something that I don't think can be understated. Anyone who's uh, working on these uh, standard output and tools that can be used to manipulate this is, is highly efficient. Uh, it also means that we can feed this data straight into our standard pipelines that we've developed elsewhere. Um, coupled with the, the annotation that's provided in the VCF format, this really is the quickest way for us to go from sample to uh, confirmed variants and report that back to pathologists and oncologists for further follow-up. So to move forward with the, the Colo 829 sample, uh, we prepared four libraries uh, using the TrueSeq Cancer uh, panel. So two from the melanoma-derived cell line and one from the, the normal uh, cell line. And we can see that if we look at the DB SNP positions that are called, uh, there's quite a good overlap uh, between the samples from the same uh, cell line and then also a, a good overlap between the normal and the tumor, uh, normal and tumor runs. The thing I would find or I do point out 
is that there's two uh, positions here that tend that dropped out of the tumor cell line. And going in and looking at these in more depth, what we can see is that these represent regions of LOH that have already been confirmed uh, by the Sanger, so both in RET and in P10. And indeed, the LOH in P10 uh, is flanked by a, a large deletion, which is uh, quite important to realize as this gives a, a double knockout of the, of the region. So this lines up perfectly with the, and it's a bit small to see, but on the Circos plot there, there's a red line uh, across chromosome 10, which represents LOH, and this is uh, perfectly in line with what we're seeing here. So this is the first of the positive controls we need to be able to detect. The next thing that we did was look at the allele ratios of those positions. And you can see that they cluster quite nicely into uh, heterozygotes and homozygotes, with ex the exception of one out in the corner here, which drops out. And again, this is a region of LOH in APC, um, which you can see here, and again, lines up with the confirmed uh, region from the Sanger uh, Cosmic Database. The last thing we obviously needed to be able to detect is SNV um, mutations. So in this instance, the only mutation that is in Colo 829 that would be covered by the, the panel is a, a BRAF V600E mutation. And usually we're fortunate to have both tumor and normal um, samples to work with, so we can detect somatic variants quite easily. But in this case, we could also detect it just by using simple filtering uh, to get down through a, a standard of um, filters applied to the VCF file and result in the single BRAF V600E um, detection. So this was all very encouraging that we could detect all our positive controls in our, uh, our known sample and run them quite quickly. The next thing that uh, was important for us was obviously the performance of the MySeq. Um, I'm just looking at the first 17 runs we did on the platform here. Um, every one of them was above spec and average yield for us is now getting close to 2.1 gigabases with uh, the Q30s up around 2 gigabases as well. In fact, we've seen with the uh, MySIC V2 chemistry that's just been installed in the lab, we're getting over 10 gig on the 2x250, so that's going to really open up some exciting uh, panels for us to look at, and that's where we'll probably go with the axon guidance uh, pathway. But I, I highlight the five um, TrueSeq uh, custom Amplicon panels that we've, we've run so far and also show that we've taken uh, samples from a, a variety of cellularities. So we really did want to check uh, across the board to make sure we could still detect uh, our known samples such as K, our known mutations, sorry, such as KRAS and any others that may be present and actionable. I think the very exciting thing, and again, it goes back to the workflow, is just how uniform the, uh, the pooling has been for us. Uh, to use the standard approach, we've gotten excellent results. Um, you can see across the, the first 48 samples we've run here, there's a, a drop off in the second half where we've changed our pooling strategy because we were getting um, the required coverage and could afford to start pooling more and more samples together. Again, the, the coverage across those uh, samples is, is excellent and we're seeing that uh, over 80% of the, the targeted region is covered at 2,000 fold in these first two, two runs, which is 23 samples. So this was uh, extremely encouraging for us and is something that we're pushing forward with more and more samples now. The KRAS detection is something of interest and as I mentioned, we find that it should be present in about 90% of cases. Um, as you can see here, there's one sample where KRAS did not show up. And this was quite an interesting sample. And when we started looking into what uh, what was the nature of this sample, we found that this was actually um, a female who was presented with pancreatic cancer at 32 years of age, which is quite young. The average onset for pancreatic is usually into the 60s. Um, this was quite a difficult case to diagnose as well. Um, it was inoperable um, for a variety of reasons, and the disease had metastasized to the, the lymph nodes. So the uh, consulting physician uh, presumed it to be pancreatic cancer. It was recruited through APGI and sent up to us for sequencing. The interesting thing here is that we're seeing um, a series of mutations that are not, um, not common in pancreatic cancer. So we have a KRAS wild type. We have a BRAF V600E mutation. We also have LOH and an indel in APC, uh, both of which are quite rare to see in pancreatic. And across our cohort of 100, uh, patients, it's 1% or less would be presenting with this sort of um, 
combination of mutations. So this suggested to us that uh, the disease wasn't actually pancreatic cancer, but actually colorectal cancer. And indeed, uh, upon feeding this back to the, the lab and the mutations being confirmed through a um, approved diagnostic lab, they were able to find a small um, primary cancer in the colon and eventually this was able to be uh, removed. And I point out that now this patient is alive and doing quite well with um, excellent follow-ups to uh, the prescribed treatments where before if she was diagnosed and stayed with pancreatic cancer, the treatment would not have been prescribed. So this is the kind of thing where we're seeing a lot of uh, area and a lot of gains being made in quite quickly. So I think with that, I'll, I'll just leave it there and make sure I don't use up too much time. So I really just want to thank everyone in my group, um, everyone at the APGI who uh, collects all the samples for us, and indeed um, Illumina for inviting me to speak. So uh, thank you.